Hello, I'm William Zogby. I'm the Chief of Cardiology here at Houston Methodist and the DeBaker Heart and Vascular Center. And it's a pleasure to have Dr. Neil Stone, uh, Robert Bono, Professor of Medicine at Northwestern. Certainly, it's a pleasure to have you, uh, Neil, and what a wonderful Grand Rounds oh. that we had a discussion on areas of lipids and, and guidelines. And certainly, Dr. Stone does not need an introduction headed the guidelines of 2013, vice chair of the guidelines on lipids. And I really enjoyed this presentation. I'll tell you my perspective on it is it humanized the guidelines <laughs> that physicians really needed to be involved as opposed to just going by the letter of what the recommendations are and look at the total patient. And uh, this is really very nice of, of you being able to put it together there. Uh, I, I wanted to maybe discuss a few things. One is the challenges that you meet as a clinician with patients, particularly adherence to the lifestyle that is probably is a little more difficult than even taking a pill. Do you, what do you use in your environment to, besides your interaction with patients? Are there some things that you could tap on? Do we need uh, ancillary people to help individuals get to their best, better lifestyles and depending on where they live and everything else? Do you use nutritionists? Do you use uh, health behavior modification, what are the things that, because to me it is among the most challenging things besides giving a pill. Yeah. Well, we have, a, we have a lot of resources. There's no, there's no <coughs> question about that. We have a lot of resources. But I think it all begins with the doctor-patient interaction, the clinician-patient interaction. Very often, I talk a little bit, one minute about lifestyle at every single visit. I have for 44 years. So. I'm pretty convinced it makes a difference. And one thing I say to people is, just tell me a little bit about your diet. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your diet? Crummy or optimal? And very often people give you a number and then I say, well, what would it take to be a higher number? Be specific. And then you learn some amazing things. They say, well, I'd have to give up my double bacon cheeseburger. I said, what? <laughs> I didn't know you were having those. Uh, or I, Dr. Stone, I, I don't have time to eat at work, so I just grab whatever the, is, is the carryout. Well, what about bringing something in? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. It literally takes me a minute or two, really not much more than that. Or if they really show that they need a lot of work to get them to a dietitian, or get them to uh, uh, some of our ancillary personnel who can help yes. them with lifestyle and, and diet. But it starts with the clinician <coughs> saying, you know, this should be a strength of yours, and it's really not. And let's just not make excuses. Let's try to decide because how to make it better, because if we can, perhaps you won't need as much medicine. Perhaps your other risk factors will yes. get better. This impacts on high blood pressure as well. And so I think, I think it begins with the clinician. That's the biggest message I would I, I have the same approach. I, I see it's effective, but there are obviously areas where you need help. The Absolutely. other thing, the other question, practical question. Um, do you use any apps, you know, and current apps for patients to help them one way or another in their lifestyle and looking at their diet, other things? I just don't know what your approach is. Well, uh, I do think there are some good apps out there. Um, and I can just say what I, I recommended. It's not based on a thorough evaluation, <laughs> uh, uh, but. Um, um, uh, there are there are two different uh, apps that uh, help people track their their diet and their exercise. I particularly um, like people who have uh, a smart a smartphone or a smart watch that helps them track activity. activity. I like to tell people it's not what you expect; it's what you inspect. And um, uh, any and so rather than mention a specific app, I would just say or a specific phone. I would just say any way you can get feedback as to what you're eating, what you're doing, how you're burning up, and can look at it. Uh, I think all of us, the first time we started using these, were amazed, and all of a sudden we'd see we're doing pretty well, and then all of a sudden one day we're hardly moving, 
And I go, oh my God, I can't believe that Sunday. I have to make it up. That this Sunday, Sunday I was so inert. And then I realized I watched grandchildren play soccer. I watched grandchildren play hockey. Before I knew it, I was so busy watching, I hadn't done anything on my own. And um, I think giving people feedback is the real promise of the wearables. And, and so um, I, uh, yes. I think there's a number of them, and I'm, I'm more interested that they use it. I've noticed there's a fatigue factor that very often people do this for one they or do. two weeks. You got it. And so <clears throat> if the doctor is aware of that, he could sometimes say, could you do me a favor and say, try it for a while, but then at least once a week, once a month, take, take three or four days off and see how you're doing. <clears throat> that creates sometimes a more um, uh, uh, practical approach because some people just won't do it forever. True. That's very true. Switching topic to risk. Um, we mentioned and you mentioned very nicely that there was actually now with electronic health record ability to check things online using the pooled equation, exactly. right? Um, the question, the critical question to you, are you still happy with the pooled equation? Are there any updates to it that bring in other factors that are not in it? I mean, you know, this is knowledge. Uh, do you use other equations to try to bring in the other factors that are mentioned in the guidelines that people may not, you know, yes, you can list them, but how do you kind of put it together? Is there, is there a way to kind of help you put it together besides yeah. that? Well, first of all, when the pooled equations were introduced, they were a great advance. First of all, they were validated by a natural history study called the Regards Trial. They had a separate equation for both white and uh, uh, African-American patients. And that was a big deal because at the same risk factors, an African-American woman at 58 may have a much higher risk than her, her white counterpart. So it was, those were very good things. But then an avalanche of criticism seemed to come out because people said, when we try it in the women's health study, it seems to overpredict. Now a follow-up paper five years later said when they brought in uh, data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, they found out that adding the objective data to subjective data, that allowed them to show that they actually did predict pretty well in older women. Uh, uh, but the point is, the pooled equations are where you begin, not where you end. Our enhancing factors are designed to bring in other factors. Yes. You've got to look at the patient. If this is a health zealot who's adhered perfectly for 10 years, their pooled equation number is going to overestimate their risk probably. Where <clears throat> likewise, if they have low SCS, or they come from a group that traditionally has a high rate of problems yeah. like an inflammatory disease, they're going to have the pooled equation will underestimate. So it's where you begin, and it needs a clinician to put that into balance. Any <clears> other <throat> equations that you use in your practice besides the pooled equation, which starts Obviously, well, I like the enhancing factors. I okay. really think that concept is one of the big steps forward in our guidelines. We had several of them in the last guidelines. Now, we didn't call them enhancing factors. We called them other factors. I right. like enhancing better. Uh, the other factors then were an LDL more than 160, family history of premature cardiovascular disease, HSCRP 2.0. Uh, 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 milligram per liter or more, or a positive ABI, but the point is that that's really not enough. And now we've expanded it, this list of enhancing factors, and again, it's a simple dot phrase on a computer. It can immediately be brought up with a keystroke. The clinician just pulls that in, and you can quickly look and see, yes, this person's South Asian with an LDL of 170. They actually, their risk is higher than we, we might expect with the pooled equation. Whereas some people have no enhancing factors, and then you find out the parents died in a bus crash at 102, and you're saying, you know, maybe your risk is going to be lower, and we really need to emphasize more on lifestyle. But I, I do believe this. I think you don't get a free pass just because you're lower in risk, and you don't need to panic because you're higher in risk. You need to put it in perspective. perspective. And, um, and uh, what I, I tell people are the four Ps of life. They need to learn to prioritize. And if you're higher risk, you've got to prioritize health care because people at high risk get into trouble. The second P is perimeters or limits. You can't eat everything you want. You can't sit on your fanny for three straight days and watch football 
uh, without doing any activity. The next P is preparation. You've got to think about how you're going to make a difference in your life. And lastly, perspective. You've got to think about where do you want to be in 10 years? Do you really want to be uh, in a hospital or with a lot of health care problems, or do you want to try to prevent them prospectively? And a lot of people can get that message and do well. That's beautiful. Very good advice. We mentioned a little bit about LP little a today, yes. as well as APO B. In your practice, when do you get these levels? And is the, still sure. the vast majority a full lipid profile? Because you get all, always the questions yeah. of, uh, one, uh, when do I do that? Yeah. And, and two is, uh, yeah, yeah, turn this off, that's, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's good connectivity. Yeah. <laughs> My patients can get me anywhere. That's what that, that's what that shows. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so the answer is the, the guidelines said that ApoB and LPA are important. They're enhancing factors. ApoB can, uh, uh, is not a substitute for cholesterol and HDL in the pool cohort equations. It's not better. Uh, we think uh, ApoB is particularly helpful in people with triglycerides above 200 because it can point out those people who really have special risks that the ApoB can signal that maybe not be shown, especially in these discordant studies with the non-HDL. And so ApoB has a real role. We said, let's particularly look at it in those as uh, elevated TGs. We think it could be a good enhancing factor. Uh, likewise, uh, LPA, not everybody, uh, the Europeans would like to do it in everybody to pick up these very high risk patients that's a, uh, uh, an interesting idea. I think that we need to determine what the consequences of that are. But uh, LPA, especially in those with a family history of, right. of, of coronary disease, can be helpful in people with familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, uh, that might help a, a physician to see a very high LPA if they were reluctant to be on too aggressive a therapy. But um, uh, LPA is not a target. Do you do it in people who have a unexpected high calcium score, uh, meaning obviously they the have disease. Don't talk about don't talk it, about but sometimes that. we see people at cath or some people have an unexpected high calcium score, but then it's a different workup. Then it's a workup of unexplained atherosclerosis. Right. And if you're dealing with unexplained atherosclerosis, you want to think of a whole, uh, a whole bunch of risk factors that might explain it. And here you're looking at inflammation, you're looking at um, whether they've got very high LPA or some other genetic factor, exactly. unusual forms of dyslipidemia. And so I think that's the workup of atherosclerosis that's unexpected. Last calcium score. Obviously, we, talk, we touched upon it today, and Kuram is with us here too, um, you know, a big pioneer in, in the area of calcium score. When do you use it? Well, I think it's a decision tool. I don't think we've got the double-blind randomized trial data to say you do it in every single person. We don't know that. But we do have two important studies, MESA and BioImage, as I pointed out today, right. that show as a decision tool in terms of helping us reclassify when a risk decision is uncertain, it is powerful. It's, it's been shown in BioImage to, to be better than carotid imaging. It's been, it's been shown in MESA to have a powerful effect if the calcium score is zero to help lower people's risk such that perhaps a statin is not a, is not a wise choice then. It can, its use can be deferred. Um, it, it, uh, it, it can be very helpful, I find, in saying to patients, look, your risk is even worse than you think. And that's why you balk it because your risk is only 9% on the, on the uh, pool cord equation. Well, actually with the calcium scoring, so it's, it's now up to... Higher. Uh, much higher number, so you're uncertain. I think this resolves our uncertainty, and it actually seems to make it a palpable difference because it's not a probability score, it's, it's a measure of the disease. Is there a objective way to incorporate uh, the pool equation, the pool equation with a calcium score? It does MESA provide well, that? Well, MESA, MESA actually gives you the shortcut where they give you the risk factors and the calcium score all in one. I think if you Google MESA uh, 
a calculator okay. or Mesa Calcium so calculator. So that includes that. With it. And then you can put your score in and see how and see what percentile you're in and how how you're doing, and that that can be very helpful for patients. Uh, besides conceivably high family, uh, you know, family history risk factor, the higher one. If a, a risk calculator tells you that your risk is below 7.5 percent, do you see a reason to do a calcium score? Well, some people say in the borderline range, 5 to 7.4, there you are may want to do that. there are positive calcium scores. So it really depends again on the the risk discussion. And we don't know that actually what, what really happens. Because I don't know what the factors are. That's where these enhancing factors. Person might have a score of six percent, particularly younger because they're younger, but may have an LDL of one seventy, uh, may um, uh, be South Asian, uh, could have hypertriglyceridemia, could be a woman who had preeclampsia, and sometimes a calcium score can can help that person in the borderline range say, you know what, I guess I'm pushed up. Or it could be zero, at which point maybe they've got, we've got time to work on lifestyle. And I never say it doesn't mean you need treatment. I say it because at remember, you're not just treating the cholesterol when you do lifestyle. You're treating blood pressure. It's so important for blood pressure. And you're helping them get off cigarettes if, if unfortunately they're on that. And you're um, helping them prevent diabetes because you want to prevent obesity. and and sedentary lifestyle and too many calories are going to lead to obesity. Well, an amazing discussion. Thank you so much, Neil, for a really uh, enlightening discussion, great questions, and, and uh, hopefully our viewers would enjoy not only this discussion here, but the grand rounds that really laid out the ground for, for this wonderful discussion. Thanks again for all your contributions and visiting us. Today. Thank you, Bill. Really Thank a pleasure. You. A pleasure.